All right. Hello. We are on topic 7.5, unresolved tensions after World War I. Some of our themes are going to focus on Western and Japanese imperial states, how they're rising and how they're maintaining control over their colonial holdings. First and foremost, looking at the mandate system, specifically focusing on the Arab lands and the question of Palestine. Among the Arab people, the thinly disguised colonialism of the mandate system clearly set off protests and rebellions. At the same time, Middle Eastern society underwent significant changes. The population grew by 50% from 1914 to 1939. Major cities doubled in size, and the urban merchant class adopted Western ideas, customs, and lifestyles. The nations of Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco were dominated by the French army and French settlers. They're the ones who owned the best lands, they monopolized government jobs and businesses, and as a result, Arabs and Berbers remained poor and suffered from discrimination. The British allowed Iraq to become independent, but they maintained a significant military and economic influence. France sent thousands of troops to crush nationalist uprisings in Lebanon and Syria. Britain declared Egypt to be independent in 1922, but through an alliance with the monarch, they retained tight control. In the Palestinian Mandate, the British tried to limit the waves of Jewish immigration that began in 1920, but only succeeded in alienating both Jews and Arabs. And in review of the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the British suggested to the Zionist leader Chaim Weizmann that they would view with favor the establishment of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. So continuing on with the Mandate system. It was an authorization granted by the League of Nations to a member nation to govern a former German or Turkish colony. The territory was called a Mandated Territory, or Mandate for short. Following the defeat of Germany and the Ottoman Turkey in World War I, their Asian and African possessions, which were judged not yet ready to govern themselves, <clears throat> were distributed among the victorious Allied powers under the authority of Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, which in and of itself was an Allied creation. The mandate system was a compromise between the Allies' wish to retain the former German and Turkish colonies and their pre-armistice declaration. The annexation of territory was not their aim in the war, and this declaration was November 5, 1918. The mandates were divided into three groups on the basis of their location and their level of political and economic development. From there, they were assigned to individual allied victors, the mandatory powers, or the mandatories. Outside of Europe, the post-war settlements created the mandate system. Instead of being given independence, the former German colonies and Ottoman territories were given to the great powers as mandates. Class C mandates were ruled as colonies. Class B mandates were to be ruled under the League of Nations supervision. In Africa, the experience of the, of the war had introduced nationalism and self-determination. In South Africa, the African National Congress argued for the right to vote for Western-educated African property owners. More Africans went to Europe and the U.S. to study after the war, and they came back with more ideas of self-determination and liberal beliefs. Class A mandates consisted of the former Turkish provinces of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. These territories were considered sufficiently advanced that their provisional independence was recognized, although they were still subject to Allied administrative control, until they were fully able to stand alone. Iraq and Palestine were assigned to Great Britain, while Turkish ruled Syria and Lebanon went to France. All Class A mandates reached full independence by 1949. Class B mandates consisted of the former German-ruled African colonies, the Allied powers were directly responsible for the administration of these mandates, but were subject to certain controls intended to protect the rights of the mandate's native people. And Class C mandates consisted of various former German-held territories that mandatory subsequently administered as integral parts of their territory. And that brings us to the Manchurian Incident of 1931. So we are focusing on the rise of ultra-nationalism within the 1930s. Ultra-nationalists, including young army officers, believed that Japan could end its dependence on foreign trade only if Japan had a colonial empire in China. 
In 1931, junior officers in the Japanese Army guarding the railway in Manchuria created an explosion on the railroad track to provide them an excuse for conquering the entire province, an action to which the Japanese government acknowledged after the fact. The League of Nations condemned this, but the Japanese simply reigned from the League of Nations in response. Japan built heavy industries and railways in Manchuria and northeastern China and then sped up their rearmament. So basically, guys, they are rebuilding their military. They are building up and they are preparing for war. At home, the government grew more authoritarian and mutinies and political assassinations committed by junior officers brought generals and admirals into government positions formerly controlled by civilians. So now we're changing gears and we're talking about China. The main challenge to the government of Chiang Kai-shek came from the Communist Party, which had cooperated with the Guomindang until Chiang arrested and executed communists, forcing those who survived to flee to the remote mountains in southeastern China. Mao Zedong was a farmer's son and a man of action who became the leader of the Communist Party in the 1920s. Mao departed from the standard Marxist-Leninist ideology when he planned to redistribute the land from the wealthy to the poor peasants to gain peasant support for a social revolution as opposed to the industrial worker and the industrial support. Mao was an advocate of women's equality, but the party reserved leadership positions for men whose primary task was warfare. Guomindang army pursued the communists into the mountains, and Mao responded with guerrilla warfare and with policies designed to win the support of the peasants. Nonetheless, in 1934, the Guomindang forces surrounded the base area of the communists, and they were forced to flee on the long march. This brought them to a much weakened, weakened state in Shaanxi in 1935. All right, so one of the quotes I really think we should focus on, such is history, such is the history of civilization for thousands of years. I want you to think about that for a minute and how you can apply it to this situation, how you can apply it to the other topics that we're going to be learning about, and then topics we've already learned about, and the history that you know that is happening right now. So pause it, reflect, and we're going to move on. The Sino-Japanese War of 1937 to 1945. On July 7, 1937, Japanese troops attacked Chinese forces near Beijing, forcing the Japanese government to initiate a full-scale war of invasion against China. The U.S. and the League of Nations made no efforts to stop the Japanese invasion, and the poorly led and poorly armed Chinese troops were unable to prevent Japan from controlling the coastal provinces of China, as well as the lower Yangtze and Yellow River Valleys within a year. The Chinese people continued to resist Japanese forces, pulling Japan deeper into an inconclusive China war. In the conduct of the war, the Japanese troops proved to be incredibly violent, committing severe atrocities when they took Nanjing in the winter of 1937 to 1938. They initiated a kill all, burn all, loot all campaign in 1940. We will come back to this topic later on, just so you know. The Chinese government of Chiang Kai-shek escaped to the mountains, where Chiang had built up a large army to prepare for future confrontation with the communists. However, Mao built up his army, formed a government, and skillfully presented the Communist Party as the only group in China that was serious about fighting back against the Japanese. After the Japanese surrender in September of 1925, the Guomindang and the communist forces began a civil war that would last until 1949. The Guomindang had the advantage of more troops and weapons and American support, but its brutal and exploitive policies and its printing of worthless paper money eroded popular support. The communists built up their forces with Japanese equipment and they had gained from the Soviets, and American equipment gained from deserting Guomindang soldiers. They won popular support, especially in Manchuria, by carrying out a, a radical land reform program. On October 1, 1949, Mao announced the founding of the People's Republic of China 
as Chiang Kai-shek Kuomintang forces were driven off the mainland and fled to Taiwan. So in summary, folks, some key things to take away. One important date, 1949, the May 4th movement. And although it be, the May 4th movement began in 1919, it does start the anti-Western feelings when demonstrations were held against the Treaty of Versailles and foreigners. And these movements will gain traction up until the founding of the People's Republic of China. Your leaders are Mao Zedong for the Communist Party and Chiang Kai-shek, the Nationalist Party, leader of the Guomindang. Mao's philosophy focused on communism and the reasons for the revolt focused on communist ideology, peasants, and land reform. And the effects that we'll see are a dictatorship and the defeat of the nationalists, social equality of classes, collective farmings, which we will talk about later. The communists were forced to make the long march 6,000 miles to evade nationalist troops. And the Chinese Civil War was suspended when the Japanese invaded in 1937, but resumed at the end of the Sino-Japanese War in 1945. All right, so changing gears and looking at the land and the people of India. Despite periodic famines due to drought, India's fertile land allowed the population to increase from 250 million in 1900 to 389 million in 1941. The majority of Indians practiced Hinduism. Muslims made up one quarter of the people of India and formed a majority in Northwest and Eastern Bengal. Colonial India was ruled by a viceroy and administered by the Indian Civil Service. At the turn of the century, the majority of Indians accepted British rule, but the racism and discrimination of the Europeans had inspired a group of Hindus to establish a political organization called the Indian National Congress in 1885. Muslims were fearful of Hindu dominance and therefore founded the All India Muslim League in 1906, giving India not one, but two independence movements. Mohandas Gandhi, also referred to as Mahatma Gandhi, was an English-educated lawyer who practiced in South Africa before returning to India and joining the Indian National Congress during World War I. Gandhi's brilliance as a political tactician and a master of public relations gestures was demonstrated in acts such as his 80-mile walk to the sea to make salt, in violation of the government's salt monopoly. Several of his fasts unto death and his repeated arrests and prison sentences. High tariff barriers were erected behind which Indian entrepreneurs were able to undertake a degree of industrialization. This helped to create a class of wealthy Indian business people who looked to Gandhi's designated, uh, sorry, <clears throat> um, high tariffs were erected behind which Indian entrepreneurs were able to undertake a degree of industrialization. And this helped to create a class of wealthy Indian businessmen who looked to Gandhi's designated successor in the Indian National Congress. When World War II began, it divided the Indian people. Indians contributed heavily to the war effort, but the Indian National Congress opposed the war, and a minority of Indians actually joined the side of the Japanese. In 1940, the Muslim League's leader, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, demanded that Muslims be given a country of their own to be named Pakistan. When World War II ended, Britain's new Labour Party government prepared for independence. But mutual animosity between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League led to the partition of India into two states, India and Pakistan. The Himalayan state of Kashmir has remained a contested site and even the location of armed conflict between these two nations since their independence. All right, we're going to stop there for today. As always, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to email me. Otherwise, have a great night, y'all.